Good morning. Um, patience. We're told it's a virtue, so I looked it up. The word patience is derived from the Latin word pati, which means to suffer, to endure, and to bear. We'll come back to that. I have the extreme pleasure of introducing our first keynote speaker of the day, Governor Jennifer Granholm. Governor Granholm is tired of waiting. She decided that waiting around for Congress to act is getting us nowhere, so listen up, private sector. She's talking about the private sector, about the private sector challenging our nation's governors in a race to the top type of competition aimed at energy innovation. She's talking about the creation of clean energy jobs. She set out to make Michigan the clean energy hub of North America by developing entire supply chains and fostering critical partnerships. Her leadership attracted more than 89,000 clean energy jobs and $9.4 billion in investment in the energy space. In short, she got tired of waiting. She got impatient, and she did something about it. Today, Governor Granholm advocates for a national commitment to advance manufacturing, worker training, and clean energy. As she pointed out in her 2013 TED Talk, if you're impatient, as I am, you know our competitors are in the game and eating us for lunch. We can get in the game or not. We can be at the table or on the table. I don't know about you, but I prefer to dine. It is my extreme pleasure, and please help me give a warm welcome to Je Governor Jennifer Granholm. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, so you all know Heather, right? Talk about somebody who's impatient and who is, as we would affectionately say inside of my, my cabinet when I was governor of Michigan, um, we used to refer to women like Heather as KABs, kick-ass broads. And I love, I love women who are impatient. So thank you very much for that, and thanks for what you're doing on this clean energy economy. So I was asked by Heather to come and um, uh, to give a, a version of a talk that I gave at the World Energy Innovation Forum a little bit ago. So any of you, or last month or whenever that was at Tesla, any of you who were there, I apologize in advance, you'll hear the message again. But as we know, in politics, sometimes you have to say something. This is what they tell us. This is what they, the advisors tell us. You have to say something 10 times before the audience hears it once, right? So I'm gonna, uh, at the risk of being repetitive for those who were there. I wanna, I wanna talk about, um, as Jim introduced this notion of the, what the EPA is doing, I wanna sort of pull us back for one second and tell you why governors like me um, are impatient, are obsessed. And so I wanna talk to you about three particular problems. One is, the problem of the loss of middle class jobs. And the reason why I raise this is because every governor in every state is dealing with the ramifications of the loss of middle class jobs. In Michigan, it was particularly acute during the two terms that I was governor. I was governor from, two, I was elected in 2010, took office in 2000, and, excuse me, I was elected in 2002, took office in 2003, and went through uh, 2010. So, this was the period of time when the auto industry melted down, when we saw this huge global shift in manufacturing jobs. And uh, this is the beautiful state of Michigan. How many of you have been to Michigan? Yes, that's awesome. That's so many of you have been to this fantastic state. Do you know that Michigan has more miles of shoreline than California? It's true. <laughs> That's what we used to claim all the time. This was our claim to fame. We got more miles of shoreline than California, more miles of shoreline than Florida. The only state that beats us is Alaska. Why? Because the upper peninsula up there, of course, is bounded by all of the uh, parts of Michigan, Michigan two peninsulas, bounded by the Great Lakes. Um, fresh water, no sharks. We, that was our claim to fame. Um, but Michigan, of course, being the automotive capital of the world and being a manufacturing powerhouse during the first decade of this century, we, have been, we were struggling, and I was certainly struggling. So I've got a, a little flag there in the middle of the state for a little city called Greenville, Michigan. And Greenville was proudly known as the refrigerator capital of North America, a little town of 8,000 people and they had the biggest refrigerator factory in North America owned by Electrolux inside of their borders. So when I was first elected in 2002, and this is for all governors, you know, they, they bring the economists to the state capitals to tell us what the economy is gonna be like. Now in 2002, if any of you remember, the nation was just emerging from a recession. And so 
everybody knows in Michigan that you know, when the nation catches a cold, Michigan catches pneumonia. But when a nation emerges from a recession, we do really well because there's pent up demand for the products that we built. So we were just coming out of a national recession. As we were coming out, the economists said to me, this and my advisors, this is a great time to come into office because the economy's coming back, Michigan's gonna be creating net jobs and you'll get all the credit as governor. So I said, well, when are all these jobs gonna be coming back? And they said, by the end of your first year, you'll see net job creation. I'm like, great, this is awesome. So at the end of my first year, the jobs were not coming back. And in fact, I get this call from the head of our Michigan Economic Development Corporation, the, the entity that helps businesses connect in Michigan with government, et cetera, provides incentives and all of that. And he says, Gov, we got a big problem in Greenville. Electrolux is threatening to go to Mexico. And if Electrolux goes to Mexico, this little town is going to be devastated. And I said, well, how many people are employed by Electrolux? And he said, almost 3,000 people in this town of 8,000 work at the factory. So if you can imagine children, grandparents, this is a one company town grown up around refrigerator manufacturing. And so I said, well, <laughs> we, this is the end of my first year in office as governor. There is no way I'm going to let this happen. So I said, we're going to bring my whole cabinet to Greenville and we'll meet with Electrolux and we'll make them an offer they can't refuse, right? Not like a Chris Christie offer, but <laughs> we, wanted to, we wanted to make sure that they stayed. So, so we, we went to Greenville, and Greenville's this charming little place, and the city halls in a, you know, could occupy, like, put three tables together, a little, you know, a little place. But everybody was there. All of the grand poobahs of Greenville were there. The mayor and the city manager and the head of the UAW who represented the workforce, the head of the community college, the head of the chamber of commerce. Everybody was there to try to figure out what we would be able to do to, to keep Electrolux inside of Michigan. And um, we all put, you know, we emptied our pockets, made a big pile of chips, slid our chips across the table to the management of Electrolux. And in this pile were things like, you know, um, zero taxes for 20 years, that we would help to build them a new factory because the factory was old and decrepit, that we would find financing for them. The UAW offered this unprecedented package of concessions that they didn't want anyone to know that they were offering because they didn't want any copycats. We just put this, it was hundreds of millions of dollars of incentives that we put on the table. And Electrolux, to their credit, took our list of incentives and they went outside the meeting to talk about it. But they were outside the meeting for 17 minutes. And they came back in and they said, you know, this is the most generous that any community or state has ever been to try to keep us. Unbelievable amount of effort that you guys put into this offer. But... There's nothing you can do, they said. Nothing you can do to compensate for the fact that we can pay $1.57 an hour in Juarez, Mexico. So we're going. When they went, and this is a picture of a guy leaving the factory on the last day, it was, um, it was like a nuclear bomb went off in this community, this little community. And the month that the last refrigerator came off the assembly line, they had, the employees had a gathering in a big pavilion, an indoor pavilion in Greenville, uh, Clackles Orchard Pavilion. And the gathering was um, called by the employees, the Last Supper. And I went to this gathering because I was obsessed and grieving over the fact, this line, there's nothing you can do. And I wanted to go, I wasn't even invited, but I, I, I could not get over it. And I tell this story because I still am not over it. I went to this gathering and all these families were sitting around eight top tables eating out of box lunches. There was a sad band playing, or a band playing sad music, <laughs> really a sad band <laughs> too. And I go up to the first table and um, there's, you know, everybody looks up because they're like, what? Wow, the governor's here. And this guy stands up and he's got a ponytail and his tattoos on and he's got his two daughters with him. And he says, he says, governor, he says, I want you to meet my girls. They're like, you know, young teenagers. 
He says, um, I've worked at this factory for 30 years. My father worked at this factory. My grandfather worked at this factory. And he says, all I know is how to make refrigerators. And then he put his hand on his chest like this. He says, so governor, tell me, looking at his daughters, who is ever going to hire me? He went from high school to factory, 18 years old. Who's ever going to hire me? And then a line formed, and everybody in the place that day had a version of that question. Who's going to hire me? I stayed till the last person left. There's thousands of people in there that day. And it was like, for me, a tipping point experience as governor, because I knew that when they blew up the factory and they built a new factory in Juarez, Mexico, that this was not just going to be about Greenville. This was going to be about every Greenville in Michigan and all of the Greenvilles, all of the Electroluxes in the 50,000 communities who lost factories in that first decade of this century. This um, was a structural shift. In fact, um, Michael Spence, formerly of Stanford, um, wrote this great study called The Evolving Structure of the American Economy and the Employment Challenge, where he identified what the big problem has been. Not really a surprise to those who are observing, but he compared the tradable sector with the non-tradable sector. And in between 1990 and 2008, the trends up are in the non-tradable sector. That's the services sector, right? And the trends in the tradable, the downwards uh, lines are various manufacturing employment, and that's all down. So what he found was that 97% of the jobs that were created between 1998 and 2008 were in the non-tradable sector. So of course, the manufacturing jobs are the jobs that paid well, service sector jobs relatively paying less. You wonder what the hollowing out of the middle class is. It's all related to this this issue of the loss of middle class jobs. Problem number one. This is an energy summit, so I'm going to get to that. Problem number two, of course, is climate change. I don't even have to say anything to this group about this. You know, uh, Jim, how many studies do we have to acknowledge that it's real? But what's important here is this second slide. Many of you are aware that the Pew um, Charitable Trusts does a survey every year about Americans' priorities. They um, look at um, 20 of them. And every year, at the top is the economy and jobs. According to people, that's their priority. And um, unfortunately, at the bottom, every year, is global warming. In some version, that's 29th, but it's, you know, it's always at the bottom. So this, this notion here about public, public um, prioritization of global warming leads us to this third problem, which is Congress. Because if the public doesn't prioritize it, Congress is not going to prioritize it either, right? And so this week, we get yet another poll out about how crummy the people view Congress. They're in the cellar of American esteem. So they're, you know, polling organizations are getting really tired of polling Congress's approval ratings. So there's a polling organization called PPP. So they decided to look at it a different way and compare Congress's approval rating to the approval rating of a bunch of unpleasant things. And so they found that Congress is viewed worse than cockroaches, <laughs> lice, root canals. They're viewed worse than the band Nickelback. They're viewed worse than Donald Trump, dog poop, toenail fungus, potholes, hemorrhoids. How bad can it get? <laughs> In fact, and they're viewed worse than heroin. How do you like that? Um, these are young people like sitting around at the polling firm thinking, what are the worst things? Which is why the band Nickelback is probably in there. But the good news is that Congress is viewed more favorably than meth labs, Charles Manson, and gonorrhea. And I know you're grateful that I did not put a picture of gonorrhea on there at breakfast. So the question is, what can we do in light of the intransigence in Congress? What can we do about these first two problems, which are jobs and climate change? What can we do 
Um, well, in a rational world, right? We would convince Congress, we'd convince them to approve a multi-year plan to invest in jobs and clean energy and infrastructure and regional economic clusters, right? That would be in a rational world. But here we are in Congress, and so the issue is what can we do? And as Heather mentioned, I am obsessed with going around them. I want to figure out ways that we can move the ball without having to wait for Congress, right? So um, I think it's some time for disruptive policy. So I'm going to quiz you now. What was the Obama administration's most effective policy? What was the policy that caused massive voluntary changes across the country? Voluntary. So I'm not talking about health care. What, what do you think was the most effective policy in terms of Changes across the country. Incentives for PV solar and other. Incentives for PV solar, well, we love those, but it didn't cause massive changes across the country. Cash for clunkers. Yeah, I loved cash for clunkers too, but it didn't, it didn't cause some changes, but voluntary changes on the part of state governments. What, what policy caused huge changes? Come on, all you smart Stanford people. <laughs> Race to the top. Race to the top for education. Why is this? Why is this? Race to the top. The, the government put out $4 billion, essentially, of public money and challenged the governors and said, you can compete for this pot of money, but here's the catch. The price to enter is that you have to raise your standards for high school so that essentially every child takes a college prep curriculum in high school. They just put that little bit of money out there, and 48 governors convinced 48 state legislatures to change their policy. You essentially had national policy, but from the bottom up. And I'm wondering if there is a new form of economic or energy federalism that we can consider, a bottom-up strategy Distributed policy, you all of you distributed generation people. Let's think about distributing policy and incentivizing that bottom-up strategy. So competitions are completely effective. I'm totally competitive. And I don't even get me in the room with a board game. Um, and woe to you who play me. But they are effective. I mean, private sector competitions like the X Prize, you see the president has lobbed this series of, of um, manufacturing innovation institutes and all of these regions of the country competed for those. You got competition in, on the private sector like Google when they put out this challenge for, for high speed fiber over 1,100 cities competed for that. In fact, you know, you had cities where they put people in fields, you know, dressed up like Google logos or something. I mean, it, people, you know, governors and public entities totally want to be recognized by the private sector and to vie for money. These kind of competitions are huge. And in fact, just this weekend, the president challenged states through a competition. Of, he's going to put out a billion dollar competitive fund to help communities prepare for the impacts of climate change. As he announced this um, in his graduation speech at University of California, Irvine, uh, this past weekend. So he recognizes that competitions are effective. So this is where I think it's going to be so interesting. Because of Congress's intransigence, I think you will see efforts to stoke action in the states, and policy is going to be distributed or bottom up. It's going to be competitive, and it's going to be nimble. In other words, one of the competitions that could occur, especially in the energy realm, is to have states compete for who can streamline their permitting process most readily, who can eliminate the barriers most readily. Those kinds of competitions states would really respond to. To me, if you respect the states and empower the govs, you could be able to create some sort of muscular, clean energy jobs race to the top, challenging all of these governors. So my, my worry is that even that, even if you had a state-based strategy, which you know I think both parties could get behind, that you still have this 
intransigence in Congress. And so really the question is, if it's not going to be Congress, who is it going to be? Might you guys have a role? Might some of the companies in this fabulous region have a role in challenging the governors? Some companies that may have some extra capital laying around who want to change the world? Couldn't you see some kind of, you know, challenge from Mark Zuckerberg or Tim Cook or something to change the dynamics across the country? That would be unbelievable. Not only would you, not only would you have 48 states, you would have 50 states who accepted, you know, an Apple challenge to the governors to be able to create energy policy. In fact, you could do it in the way that the president, president had uh, articulated a goal of getting 80% of our energy from clean sources by the year 2030. You could, do, you could do that broadly defined. You'd have every state in. I'm just saying. So it, it makes me um, encouraged that what's happening in the administration is the use of executive tools to be able to push this ball forward. And um, I'm very opportunistic in terms of seizing the moment on of movement. And this particular movement at the EPA with Rule 111D that Jim was talking about, where you've got to, each state has to reduce, obviously, their, their carbon footprint um, by 30 percent. Um, I think that there is a moment there. People are freaking out about this a little bit. There is a lot of fear around 111D, but I think that it is a moment to flip the script and say this is a moment for prosperity. Because if every state's got to reduce their carbon footprint by that, they're going to need the products that get them there. And all of you green shade capitalists out here would see that as a market signal, that those products can be made and sold in the US. Now, the made in the US part, that's what I'm my obsession is. We lost a little bit the first wave of renewable energy and clean technology to Asia. And the question is, are we going to allow that to happen? We can continue to be hands off. We can decide, you know, let the market bear. But our, our competitors are not doing the same thing. This is a moment for states and for us all to say, this EPA rule, it is such a huge opportunity for these states. Why? Because every state has something to offer. So, you know, whether you look at the efficiency side or the energy generation side, you've got all these solar states, you've got all these wind states, you have all these biomass potential states, you've got states like uh, in the north, near northwest that do geothermal, you've got uh, hydro, uh, and you've got energy efficiency in the north, northeast, you've got offshore wind on the Atlantic coast, you've got hydro on the upper west, you've got electric vehicles, um, Tennessee and Michigan, but obviously Tesla here. So there, and uh, Texas probably has it all. You know, in the NRDC, Ralph Cavana is over here. Thank you so much. The NRDC is doing these estimates of what energy efficiency can get these states. So, for example, Florida, according to NRDC estimates, will see 10,000 energy efficiency related jobs because of Rule 111D. You'll see in Iowa, another 2,500 energy efficiency jobs. What a huge opportunity for Colorado, another 2,700 energy related jobs, wind energy in Colorado. This is, I have a young man from Colorado who helps me with these slides and he's like, I'm gonna put this thing in there about wind energy in Colorado is cheaper than natural gas. Totally true, of course. In Michigan, um, the, the NRDC is estimating 6,900 energy efficiency jobs. And if you layer upon the energy efficiency jobs, the energy generation related jobs. If you put in place the policies inside of these states that could attract the building of these advanced energy products, I'm telling you, it's a moment for this country. Prosperity could be upon us. In Michigan, just as an example, when I was governor, we created a whole suite of policies around various slices of the energy generation pie. And we ended up, when I left, we had 258 clean energy businesses. As Heather mentioned, $9.4 billion invested and 89 9,000 projected jobs by 2020 in the energy realm. Broadly speaking, a big focus we had on, on uh, lithium-ion battery for, the, for vehicle 2.0. 
since we built vehicle 1.0. But my point here is that policy matters. And if you could stoke the states to be able to develop the right policy, then you could see national energy strategy happening. Now, what's our na national economic development strategy right now? You have a guy like Rick Perry coming to California to poach jobs. In fact, I did this all the time too. Every governor goes to other states to try to woo jobs and throw their tax incentives on the table to get there, right? But what a stupid national strategy that is. You're just moving these jobs around the country. And believe me, governors do not have the resources to be able to compete against China or India or Mexico, but we do have the resources to compete against one another. And, and this sort of competition among governors is stoked by, there's a, ma there's a magazine called um, um, Site Selection Magazine. And this site selection magazine goes to all the governors. And there's, called, there's something called a governor's cup in site selection magazine, where the governors compete with one another. And we, sh we submit all of our filings by the end of the year. And the governor that has poached the most jobs is the winner of the governor's cup. And we get all together, all the governors at these National Governors Association meetings, and we're like, I was number one in the governor's cup. I was number one. So we are all about this, this competition. But right now, it is not a good national strategy. So to me, this, this is why, and I'm just going to make a brief commercial here, that I'm, I'm actually um, at, at uh, the Berkeley Energy and Climate Institute as a senior, senior research fellow now. And I'm teaching at Berkeley, my undergraduate alma mater. And we're launching something called the American Jobs Project. And the hope here is to take Rule 111D and the time frame, the one-year time frame, and to look at 10 key swing states, because we don't want to go either way. We want to be, you know, receptive, get receptivity on both sides, and say not only what, how many jobs could they get from the energy efficiency side, but how many jobs could they also get if they created economic clusters in clean tech, depending on their incumbent industries and their resource endowments. We want to be able to say that this Rule 111D, but also the the strategy of creating jobs is something the US is not going to give up on, and that policy does matter in this. We know that globally, between 2004 and 2013, according to Pew and, the, and um, Bloomberg um, Finance, there is a $2 trillion investment, private sector investment, in clean energy solutions, $2 trillion. Now, just in, in China alone, which we all know is the mother of all markets, um, last year, 61 0.3 billion in private sector investment in clean energy. And in the US, it was 48 billion. So huge market opportunity, 37 uh, uh, you know, jobs, one, one, 37 million jobs, one in four jobs by 2030 are the estimates of how many jobs. The question is, where in the world are those jobs going to be? Who's going to win those jobs since all this investment is happening and by doing nothing, we end up being accomplices to the loss of these jobs and the loss of that opportunity. So I put George Bush up here um, and uh, Hu Jintao. And if any of you read George Bush's biography, Decision Points, he describes a conversation that he has with leaders on a regular basis. And he would sort of start a, a conversation by you know, an icebreaker, like, you know, what keeps you up at night? And of course, what kept George Bush up at night was the fear of terrorism. When he asked that question to Hu Jintao, Hu Jintao said, what keeps me up at night is creating 25 million jobs a year for my people. I want leaders who are kept up at night by trying to figure out what policy they can adopt that will create jobs for our people. That's what I am obsessed about. As Heather said, you know, we're, we are either on the table or we're on the menu. And I was recently, Excuse me, we're either at the table or we're on the menu. If you're on the table, you are on the menu. <laughs> um, I, was, I visited uh, China recently, and um, there was a, uh, um, uh, in, at this meeting, there was a series of meetings with uh, Securing America's Future Energy Safe. And at this um, event, at these series of events, we went to a number of cities where they were showing us how many jobs China was creating in clean energy. And uh, at one of the sort of dog and pony show moments, I was standing in the back of the room with a, um, 
uh, a Chinese mayor, and he leans over to me and he says, so when is the US gonna get energy policy, national energy policy? And I said, you know, Tea Party, I don't know, Congress, blah, blah, I don't know if it's gonna happen anytime soon. And he gets a big grin on his face and he says, take your time. <laughs> take your time because our passivity is their opportunity. So if we don't crack this, if we do not get active in intervening, yes, in the market, to be able to create a market for these clean energy products, if we don't do public-private partnerships to make sure that companies can bridge the valley of death, if we don't have the right financing in place in these, in these communities, we are gonna lose the second wave of innovation as well. And I, I just wanna know, you know, who can ensure that we are not on the menu, who can create good jobs and reduce this carbon footprint? Who is gonna challenge the governors to create clean energy jobs? Who is going to save our planet from death and destruction? Who, who can do it? Is it Elon Musk? <laughs> is, it, is it Sergey Brin? Could we do a Google challenge? Maybe our next president can do this whoever she is. <laughs> and that is my speech to you this morning, but we're gonna take some questions. So, I'm sorry. Forgive my partisan moment. I know this is a nonpartisan crowd, so forgive my little partisan moment. But bottom line is, I do think there is an opportunity for the next president to lob a series of challenges to the governors, but all of that requires a number of steps. Democracy is a really important strategy of responding to the gridlock in Congress, but it requires elections and people who get out and vote and make sure we change the uh, faces of those who are blocking. I do think a private sector challenge would be um, immediate and effective, but that's my call. So what can we, what can I, uh, can, we, can we do a little question and answer? Do we have a little time to do that? Awesome, great. Any, any thoughts? What do you guys see? as the opportunity in this energy sphere at the, at the nexus between jobs and policy. Jan, Jan Pepper. Well, I just have a question for you, getting back to one of your initial comments about, what was it, $1.37 per hour in Mexico? Hour. I don't know yeah. what the labor rates are in China. So how do we compete against that? Right, so I mean, this is something I would, um, the, the question that Jan asks is a question I'd love to hear from you on, but my understanding of what's happening in this space is first of all, obviously advances in productivity and advanced manufacturing um, reduces the labor issue, the labor arbitrage that's happening, that has happened in the past, that there um, certainly is an opportunity when you blend technology uh, with manufacturing so that you don't separate your research and development from the actual manufacturing process. And I think, honestly, the Internet of Things, the embedding of software and hardware, of sensing data, of data going back to uh, companies, that provides a huge opportunity for us to keep jobs here because it is advanced. Now, the, the question for the middle class is, yes, you have to develop programs to upskill people to be able to take on those more advanced products. But honestly, I mean, even in Michigan, the, you know, they're not hiring people for like engine factories that don't have a certification or some kind of degree. You need to be able to provide the training programs, but you also need to be able to keep research and, and development and production near one another. So I think we have a moment if you have the right policy in place. Yes, sir. Wait, wait, hang on. We're gonna, uh, you want me to, you want me to um, take the mic? Here, you want me to run the mic over to him? Because <laughs> you can see where I'm looking. I'm just, Jeff Bush. Yes, um, I was just curious what you would say to the governor of Texas who might say that oil and gas production, not clean energy, has led to a massive amount of jobs and help preserve some of the industrial base. So on our project, I can tell you this, the, Amer the American Jobs Project, we are not dispar disparaging other types of energy. What we're doing is saying, this is a huge market opportunity. 
Um, I might suggest that natural gas provides an opportunity for lower cost manufacturing here, and that is another way to be able to keep jobs here. But what we're saying is that if you want a market signal, which is happening, that develop policies, doesn't have to be either or, develop policies that allow for the explosion of clean energy jobs inside of a state. If we want a bipartisan support of this project, you cannot disparage other forms of energy. Um, here, where's our, you, got, you have somebody back there? All right, he's identifying the people. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let him do his job and hopefully he'll come back to you, okay? All right. Hi. Good morning, thank you, Good Governor. Good morning. Uh, my Tell name me is, who you are. Yeah. Um, I'm David Rosenheim with the Climate Registry. David. Good morning. Um, so I agree that there's great opportunity um, and action at the executive level, such as 111D. But what happens if there is a, a change of guard uh, in the executive? What happens to these initiatives? Well, that's why we come back to Google challenging the governors. <laughs> if there is a change of guard, meaning uh, to a president that is not favorably disposed, as you see, I don't think that's going to happen. But, um, but if we did get a president that's not favorably inclined to do this, um, I think uh, two things. One is that you, I, I would so strongly encourage a banding together of some of these major entities here who care about it and who have all sorts of money potentially parked offshore to be able to change the world. I mean, if you, if you, is, you know, it's like $3.4 billion cost 48 governors to change their standards. If you had a few of, of those entities band together to challenge the governors to do energy policy, then you would jump over Washington, essentially. And I think that is a possibility, but you'd have to get people who are willing to look at that. Um, I, I do think, second, that a strategy of empowering the states is one that would be accepted by both political parties. Something that recognizes that states should be able, and it's one of the reasons why I don't think you've seen, um, you know, you've seen some pushback before the EPA rule come, came out, but actually it's been a little more muted than some of us thought it would be. Um, because there is, it was smartly designed to allow the states the flexibility to achieve that goal on their own. It was not heavy. Top down, it was bottom up. So bottom up strategies give me hope, um, as well as the private sector gives me hope. Next, you've got it. All right. Yeah, I've got my mic now. Thank you. Um, I was very Bruce. Bruce. Yes. Bruce Tarney. Yes. Right. I was very moved by your story about Greenville, and it reminded me that there's a city I believe is called Greenville in Kansas that was wiped off the map by a tornado several years ago, and huge amounts of FEMA money came in to rebuild it and they're going to try to make it a green, energy-efficient town as it's rebuilt. Um, tell us what, if any, federal resources were applied to your Greenville and how that town is doing today. Yeah, we, um, so in Greenville, Greenville, Michigan, tried to live up to its name as well and decided that it was going to focus on solar panel production. And so they um, recruited a couple of um, solar firms to be able to do this. Again, this was before the glut of solar panels uh, on the market. Um, and the, the firms applied for federal loan guarantees to be able to um, expand and put their capital in the ground. Um, uh, it took so long for that to happen that they, they, they were not able to make a go of it. So unfortunately, the solar play did not work in Greenville. And, and to me, it's an example of if you have a great intention, but without um, effective deployment of policy, then it's, it's never gonna work. You know, it's just not gonna work. That all happened like in the early 2000s um, when there was, there was still a loan guarantee uh, strategy of the federal government, um, and obviously there was since 2008 as well. But if you don't have the smart blending of policy um, that enables firms to be able to get their capital in the ground, like other countries are doing. I was just, I was actually um, moderating recently a panel at the Business Roundtable, and I was asking them, which country, which country, these are all CEOs, right, of the biggest companies. So the CEO on this panel, CEO of, of uh, Dow Chemical, the CEO of AT&T, the CEO of John Deere. And I said to them, which country, if, which country would you pick to go and locate in? Which country does it best in terms of, of, of actively making businesses a partner for success? Which country do you think they said? Singapore, Singapore. Now, Singapore obviously doesn't have a democratic system like we do, 
but they have an incredible series of policy strategies that make businesses successful, including a handshake when they come, helped in supply, in introducing them to supplier chains. They did a SWOT analysis, their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. They've decided which industries they're good at. They have foreign direct investment goals, which we don't necessarily have as a, co a country. So my point is on this, is that without policy and action, you're not gonna, you're gonna see continual loss of jobs to our economic competitors who are very, very hungry for these kinds of opportunities. I point to you, and I'm probably going Hi. out of order. Yes. Hi, how are you? Um, Susan Rosakis from Stanford, and um, I had a question. As you empower states, how- Wait, wait say it again. Say as you empower state uh -huh. government, right? and the conditions that come along with that, and all the rules and all the people that get involved, um, how, as the private sector, can you, can you make more, or how can you, I guess, the government sector, make that more efficient? How can you make the government sector more efficient? Correct. Right. Because when things come our way, they tend to be, have so many conditions and rules right. upon them I mean, that this, it's very difficult. I think this is such an important thing. So, so part of what we're doing in this American Jobs Project is, is looking at industrial clusters. And one of the good inputs to any industrial cluster, there are nine inputs, but one of them is making sure that the regulatory environment is streamlined so that it is not taking a, a firm you know, 18 months to get an, a permit. It's just insane. Or that you do not have triple, triple permits, et cetera. That, that if they are challenged to streamline these, you can collapse permits and you can collapse permitting times. You can, you can do what we did in Michigan was called a value stream mapping, essentially, of the waste in a system, in a permitting system, in a regulatory system. You know, and, and a lot of these rules were set up at a time that made perfect sense, but they're anachronistic now. And so everything should be able to be done online other than the physical inspections that need to happen. They should have reciprocity among permitting. They should leverage technology. But there needs to be a little stoking of that challenge because there's a lot of interests that are attached to those particular processes at the local level. There, you know, there are building inspectors that have jobs that are associated with that. OK, great. So have the state government accept the local building inspector report instead of having you know, separate layers of inspection requirements. So there are definitely ways to do this. And here in Silicon Valley, you leverage technology all the time. I mean, if you had a challenge to governors, for example, just to streamline permitting and, and uh, put a little pot on the, on the table, and those who win the challenge get to have use some of that money to be able to deploy the technology in those states to be able to streamline, you could totally get this done. But without a push, there's incredible inertia in the system. I, do they have the... Hi, Judith Schwartz of To The Point. So I, you know, I like the basic concept of what you're saying, but one of the challenges of the business model of venture capitalism and corporations is they have to make money. Yeah. And I think the difference, and they're not set up to invest billions and trillions of dollars. So that's part of the disconnect. And I think that th what I worry about is why would a Google or whatever invest the money in this kind of thing that they may or may not win the bid to get the money back if the states deploy it. And what was it about the race to the top that got the Republican governors to cooperate? Because unless there are some Republican leaders who will be realistic about this, how is this really going to happen? Right. So, so, so with respect to the, the race to the top, the Republican governors and the Democratic governors were all in because governors are always hungry for money. And we don't have extra money to be able to invest in education. That money was going to be available to invest in education. Everybody wants to do that. And at the time, everybody agreed that having high standards was a really good thing. There's some debate about that now, apparently. But, um, but at the time, it was a really big deal. And there were certain catches to be able to access the competition. In the first round of that competition, only four states won. They've had subsequent rounds of competition, so everybody's in. But what do you think? Who do you think are the two states that didn't compete? Texas and South Carolina were the two states that did not compete. So money is a huge motivator for these governors. The second thing I would say is, if it were in the private sector, it would even be a bigger motivator. You see all these cities that tried to compete for Google, you know, the designation to get Google uh, broadband or you know, high-speed fiber laid. If, you, if there were a challenge 
that was a challenge, a selfless challenge, because I, I know that companies want to make money, but they also have, you know, they do a lot of investment that doesn't expect a return too, because it's good for them to be able to say, I, I helped to change the world. If you had a challenge from some of these, you know, from banding together a couple of these companies saying, it's really important for us in the future that this nation help to lead on climate change or on energy solutions, that's really, yeah, we may have some opportunity to play in that, but it's really important for the country that we move this ball forward. You know, that's really the question. You've got all of these billionaires who have banded together who pledge to give half, to pledge to give their money away. Just put a few of them together and say, challenge the governors. And you would see national energy policy. And in that, you have to have some basics. All right, so we're going to allow states to enter the competition, but you have to agree to get 80% you know, of your energy from clean sources. You define clean by 2030. It's broad enough to allow everybody in. They can decide what their resources are, what their resource endowments are. I think that you would see a massive uptake. The question is, do you have the, um, the corporate support of being able to change this ball, solve this intractable problem? And I think that there are a lot of generous companies in this area. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. It's a very uh, impressive talk. Uh, I just have one question. So you talk about losing manufacturing jobs to the other countries. Um, labor cost, of course, is one of the important ones, but I think there are other very important reasons as well. For example, like the way that we actually currently manufacture those clean energy devices are, are actually not so clean, which basically means that if you, you have a very tight uh, environmental regulation, you will have a expensive, very expensive factory if you want to build up one. So that's why Tesla did not pick, even pick up the California in the first round when they tried to select the factories. Uh, locations for their uh, batter, battery factories. Is that so a Mar done deal, though? Uh, what? Is that a done deal? Is Tesla? Yeah, California was not even in the first uh, candidates. Uh, but aren't uh, they sort of back in the mix now? Uh, Rumor has it. I don't have any inside okay. information. Yeah, no, for yeah. that. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'm not. not I, I don't have wrong. the up-to-date message. But basically, the point is that how, as a policymaker's point of view, how can you mitigate? these kind of uh, conflicts. Yeah. In one hand, you want to get back the job, but in the other hand, how do you deal with those environmentalists? Uh, or how to, are you able to uh, lose right. the, 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 the right. so yeah, I, regulations? This is a really important question, is that can you have an environmental regime that allows for, that encourages clean manufacturing at a cost that's competitive globally, right? That's essentially your question. And, and to me, We've got um, the smartest people around in this room and in this region. If we can't figure out that by, by whether it's streamlining or removing some waste from the, from the process of the bureaucracy, if we can't figure out how to help get capital in the ground, because so much of that has to do with upfront capital, right, to be able to do that, if we can't figure out the financial instruments to allow those who want to input factories in the ground how to monetize their tax credits so that they can get the money up front to be able to do that, if we can't provide incentives for the venture capital community to do longer term investment, then, then we're throwing up our hands and saying it's okay for them to all go. I think you can have your cake and eat it too, but it's gonna require smart policy. And the way you get smart policy is by stoking, in my opinion, co is through competition, like the private sector. There's all these competitions for private sector technology breakthroughs. I think there needs to be competition for public policy breakthroughs to be able to solve the toughest problems like that. Uh, and I, I think we, could, we have time for one, one more. more. I know we're, we're, uh, yeah. I'm running up against it, but you're right John Mashey, TechVisor. So I have a question for you on education, but the context is uh, uh, middle class jobs in Singapore. Okay? So the, the, and, and I'll give you the question and then give you the context. So okay. the, the question is, are, are, is our education system set up right to do, help those middle class jobs? And if not, what we, can we do? And the context is, you know, we got a lot of mass, mar mass or middle class jobs after World War II because we were the only industrial economy left standing, right? I was in Singapore to review a place called Republic Polytechnic, which um, is a, for 17 to 19 year olds. And their explicit mission was um, 
take second and third quartile folks and make them as good as they could be for the economy that they had coming. And believe me, they were pretty impressive. Now, Singapore's its own strange place, right? But it sure looked to me, they, to, kids worked in teams. They had specific things that could get them ready for jobs. They were not necessarily geared up to go to a four-year school. Some did, right? The question is, um, yeah, you know, to me, that's the long-term thing that makes yeah. Singapore really competitive. Yeah, I, I, this is a really important piece of this pie. How do you make sure you've got the talent to be able to take on those advanced manufacturing jobs? And, and if you look at best practices around the world, you can look at Singapore, you can look at Germany. I mean, Germany didn't lose their manufacturing base. Germany has this incredibly robust system for young people to be able to be trained on floors, working in teams. Why wouldn't we just borrow, I know we're exceptional as a nation, but exceptional companies and exceptional nations borrow best practices from other places and poach good ideas. And to me, um, the current, for example, workforce training dollars is an example of an anachronistic system. It was set up, made had perfect sense, but it does not allow the configuration of those dollars to deal with the people where they are. You were asking a question about Greenville and what happened to those folks. I mean, we, we had to reconfigure the whole workforce training because we had such a mass number of people like that guy with the ponytail. And, and a lot of those guys, the middle career folks, not to mention, of course, the ones who are coming up, they're intimidated by Stanford. They're certainly intimidated by universities. But um, they wouldn't be intimidated in learning how the next process looks for a clean energy manufacturer if, they, if you taught them in the union hall or if you taught them on site. So we've got to look totally differently at that. To me, that's a, that's a huge opportunity, again, to challenge the governors to repurpose the existing workforce training dollars that they already have. This would get bipartisan support, because you already have a bunch of money going out the door for workforce training, trade adjustment assistance. If you allowed the governors to configure those dollars in ways that addressed both the, you know, the interns and the young people coming up, as well as the mid-career people, you could have some slam dunk results, but right now it's locked up in bureaucracy. And I know that, I think that was the last one. Hey, I, I so appreciate being able to uh, come here to this sort of font of all wisdom um, to be able to share a, a concept which I think you'll see more of, not just for me because it is happening, this bottom up strategy, but I really, um, I, I really am grateful that there is such interest in the nexus between policy and energy. I know that many of you will be talking about technology, but you can't proliferate that technology without policy here. Policy matters, and thank you so much for allowing me to come.